So again, hope, hopefully you guys are in the right room. I know it's a little bit of 10 minutes late, but uh, hopefully we'll make it worth it. Probably skip through a few things, but it's okay. There'll still be a plenty of information uh, to start. Uh, who's familiar with embedded, with, with embedded Linux specifically, uh, let's say with either, either developing uh, or reverse engineering uh, embedded devices? Show of hands. Awesome, that's great. Uh, well, how about web? Anybody familiar with web, web application security or pen testing or, okay, I would think. <laughs> how about hardware? Anybody familiar with hardware, hardware hacking? A few, okay, no problem. Again, so my name is Aaron. Uh, a few things are probably gonna look a little bit different from uh, what it looked on my computer, but that's fine. Uh, my Twitter handle here is uh, scriptingxss. I'm from Los Angeles, so quite of a ways to get here, but definitely worth it. Uh, I've spoken at DEF CON IoT Village the last couple of years. Uh, hopefully I'll be there again this year with some car hacking research that I just did. Fun stuff. Uh, if you guys are there, feel free to, to, to ping me. Uh, I've also spoken at DerbyCon, HackFest, uh, RSA, uh, B-Sides, various B-Sides, and uh, AppSec California, which is uh, one of the conferences that, that we run from uh, OWASP Los Angeles, representing right here. Uh, so we have our conference in the last week of, of January, so uh, if it's cold over here, feel free to you know, go across the pond to LA. We're right on the beach in Santa Monica. If you guys want to volunteer, I run the volunteers. Uh, feel free, and like I said, uh, I'm from uh, Los Angeles, so I'm on the board for OWASP Los Angeles, as well as uh, Cloud Security Alliance, Southern California. So even if you guys are in the area, you guys want to stop by, even give a talk, feel free again uh, to ping me. Uh, I'm also on OWASP Slack, so first name, last name. Um, I've also, uh, in the past, uh, I think last year, I was a technical editor for a Practical Internet of Things book uh, that's published by Packet Publishing. And currently, right now, I'm working on uh, a pen testing IoT cookbook for packet publishing as well. Um, so it'll be uh, testing from hardware, from firmware, from mobile apps, web apps, and that should be out sometime in, uh, in the summer. So pretty busy as of late. Uh, in the past as well, my past employer, I used to work for uh, Balkan and Linksys uh, on the Linksys side uh, for networking. So that's kind of where I've gotten to the whole IoT and embedded. Uh, a, lot, a lot of what uh, I'm gonna talk about is from my experience working for a manufacturer and also testing other manufacturers as well for peer research and talk. Sometimes I just buy, buy products and you know just, just to hack and just to mess with them. Uh, very fun, some of the things I'll probably talk about today, uh, some of the things I've discovered. So let's get started, embedded devices. Uh, if you don't know what that, what that even means um, and how they're even made, we're gonna get to that. Um, generally or loosely, embedded equals IoT. It's just now they're network connected. Um, so you guys might be familiar, you know, we have smart homes and that's just one, one aspect of, of IoT. We have connected vehicles now, which, which have the hardware, which have the software, which have the wireless, which have Bluetooth, which have inputs and outputs. Uh, we have wearables. Wearables are really fun. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. We have smart cities, uh, a few smart cities in the world. We have smart buildings as well. Uh, definitely, you know, where the world is going and it's kind of inevitable as well. Uh, so recently, last week, I just bought uh, a few uh, wearable medical devices uh, for research. Um, over in the States, we have something called flexible spending accounts, so we could buy anything that's medical related. And uh, I bought a couple uh, or a few different uh, devices that manage uh, your health and, and report it to uh, a doctor here. This is called uh, ClinicCloud, so I'll get to my research uh, with that probably in, in another talk, but you basically send your info to a doctor and they can help you out, send recordings, you can imagine. But, um, you know, also pain, pain relievers, they all have mobile apps, they're all Bluetooth. Um, you know, definitely a playground for people like me and whoever else likes to get into wireless and, and hardware and software as far as firmware is concerned. Um, so to briefly go over some of the, the threats that happened last year, if you're not familiar, again, we'll start with medical just because it's kind of the topic right now with, uh, with wearables. But, you know, we have insulin pumps that, you know, plenty of CVEs that were found, insulin pumps and, and clear text communications and, and privacy issues and sending data, you know, where it shouldn't be, uh, being sent to third parties uh, without authorization. Uh, you have the consumer aspect where there's plenty of backdoors as well, uh, and that still continues uh, from last year to this year, uh, meaning, you know, a backdoor account, whether it's a root account, usually a root account, uh, and any type of embedded device. Uh, command injections are everywhere. Uh, being able to arbitrarily inject 
shell commands, let's say via ping or any type of troubleshooting um, aspect of, of a device, a thermometer, um, even uh, routers as well, pretty common. And then Mirai, we'll get into Mirai in just a second. Who's familiar with Mirai? Oh, not that much. Okay, well, basic, well, we'll get to it in a second. Biggest thing that happened last year, huge. And connected vehicles, you know, everywhere. I love connected vehicles. That's why I literally bought uh, my vehicle uh, three months ago just so, I can, just so I can remotely unlock it, uh, remotely start the car if I was able to uh, be able to chain different attacks. Uh, it's, again, like a playground uh, as far as, uh, you know, connected vehicles and even the research last year with Tesla, various, various uh, disclosed vulnerabilities with Tesla and even Ford and, and other companies like that as well. Uh, as far as commercial, we know cameras, we know small business cameras, and that, that also contributed to Mirai. Uh, ransomware, credit card machines, who's heard of the, the hotel that was supposedly locked in, you know, uh, uh, people, you know, who were staying there, but, you know, it was actually the credit card machine that was turned down, so it wasn't really everybody who was locked in their room. Uh, but still, it's still ransomware, it's still affecting an embedded device, it's still a credit card machine, it still had firmware, still relevant. Um, but it's funny, we kind of get into these, uh, these fear-mongering scenarios, uh, people getting locked into, you know, you know, their whole tower rooms, 500 people, whatever it may be. It's definitely real. Uh, the same with connected vehicles. You know, when you have something pop up and you infotain a system that you need to pay however much Bitcoin in order for your car to stop, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm going to stop. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Turn it off. But still, you know, just the fear aspect of uh, ransomware is, is another. It doesn't always have to be crypto. Uh, just the fear aspect could, could be enough unfortunately. And then same thing with industrial, industrial control systems. Hard-coded passwords, meaning backdoors. Same problems throughout all each of the different industries uh, last year. And again, this year and the year before and the year prior. You know, so you, you can kind of see the trend. Uh, not much has changed. A lot of these vulnerabilities are, are simplistic in nature, uh, which is great for us. Because uh, you know, there's, there's simple patterns that we can look for as uh, you know, either someone who's an attacker or even from a developer standpoint. So again, Mirai. Mirai was huge. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I mean, it took down Netflix and, and uh, SoundCloud and Etsy, uh, our, our whole, you know, east coast of internet uh, back home in, in, in the States. And, uh, you know, obviously I wonder, you know, what the quantitative analysis came out, you know, for businesses being down for a few hours. So, and it's still, you know, there's, there's different variants of... Uh, of Mirai, but you know, they were saying, you know, it's this 400 pound hacker right here, just pressing buttons. If you don't know the reference, I'm not gonna go into it. Uh, but now we have different spins of Mirai. Ijami, Brickerbot, there's a new one that just came out a couple days ago, uh, uh, Perserai. And uh, these are basically like vigilante, vigilante botnets of, of Mirai to trying to fix or shut down the services for let's say Talonet. Uh, and BrickerBot is basically bricking the device itself uh, to take them off the internet. And you have Perseri, which is they're taking advantage of, of zero days and doing the same thing, preventing other um, uh, bots from getting access to that device. So it's kind of a, a free, free for all war. They're using Mirai as a, it's kind of a template uh, for IoT botnets. Uh, and then it's only, like I said, a matter of time uh, until we'll see something like ransomware affect all these devices. And again, if you, if you reset, those devices back to defaults, uh, all they have to do is rerun their script and, you know, be like DJ Khaled, another one. Just keep grabbing them and grabbing them. And which, which is what comes down to, you know, Internet of Poems. We have just everything, you know, a lot of these devices are being publicly accessible just by their provider, by their installer. We have a lot of small businesses that are installing these IP cameras and these DVRs, which is the devices that were affected by Mirai. It's not necessarily routers themselves. Uh, not, not by far. It's mostly just IP cameras that are facing the internet as well as DVRs and ver various different kinds. But I mean, why that happens uh, and how, well, first the attackers find it by obtaining the firmware in, in some form, uh, analyzing the firmware, extracting the file system, mounting the file system to, to uh, analyze the file system contents and configuration and almost like static, static analyze their code because you can pretty much see it, uh, all client-side code, the, 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 uh, the web server, uh, the configurations, any type of users that are configured, um, and also emulating the firmware for dynamic analysis and runtime analysis. So, so throwing something like a, a web scanner, uh, 
bypassing authorization using something like Zap, uh, runtime analysis using something like GDB. Um, you know, there's plenty of plenty of tools for that. Uh, put a quick little link there if, if you guys you know want to want to grab that for uh, for research. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and make these slides available. I think I already sent a PDF as well, so no need to rush. Just trying to stay on track here. But the main reason why and how these devices are created the way they are and why the vulnerabilities are the way they are uh, in IoT and, and in Embedded is because there's supply chain. You start with the PCB, then you have uh, a board support package vendor like Broadcom, like Marvell, uh, and then you have, uh, and they have their own SDK. And then you have an ODM, original uh, device manufacturer, who uh, builds their SDK on top. And this is uh, like Zhang Mai, who, uh, Zhangmai Technologies, who were the ODM for all the Mirai uh, uh, devices. So they also sold them to resellers um, and different other manufacturers uh, who put their name on it as the OEM. And now they have also a cloud service provider, which is someone like Amazon, uh, someone like Azure, because you know all these DVRs now, all these IP cameras, uh, even routers um, are all like SaaS platforms. Now you have a hybrid type of uh, setup where you have the embedded device in your network and you have um, basically a, a tunnel over to uh, the, um, the vendor's cloud and that opens up a port into your network without having to port forward. So now you have uh, basically piercing NAT straight into your network, into your local, your local LAN uh, for access for video uh, and sound uh, is how these uh, uh, DVRs and IoT devices are being deployed using something like a stun server. Who's heard, of, who's heard of stun before? Awesome. Well, Pierce is not. Just know that you don't have to port forward. They think it's easy remote access, but easy remote access means you're opening up a port. If someone, if someone will be able to scan on that port, they can pierce right through your NAT just as well. So it's common for, like I said, voice and video. So uh, voice over IP systems also use a similar tactic uh, for real-time communication, RTC. So the supply chain is the reason why these devices uh, are vulnerable just because so many different hands, so many different codes are uh, code uh, code bases are touching one single device, and then you also have the mobile apps, the web applications, uh, you have the the desktop, you know, thick apps as well. Not, not to mention the wireless and then the firmware. You know, attack surface is huge, and all these are different teams and even farmed out to you know third parties. You know, the, the ODMs uh, again are the main corporate. I put an arrow there because they're the main reason why IoT supply chain and the vulnerabilities are the way they are. It's not gonna change. They're basically a dime a dozen, probably a 10 person team that are around for three to five years. So when you find a bug in a, in a five year old uh, device and uh, you, know, you go back to the vendor and ask them to patch it, they have no way to go back to the ODM or go back to the supply chain and even back to the, the BSP, like Broadcom or something like that to, to fix the driver and fix it all the way down to all their devices and patch it. So it's an interesting problem uh, and I, I'm not confident that it'll be fixed anytime soon unless there's some sort of uh, incentive or closed type of environment similar to Apple, but again, that's kind of out there. Um, so common operating systems that, the, that these embedded devices are running on are embedded Linux, uh, variants of Android, really old kernels. I've seen a lot of new products on even Kickstarter that are based on uh, 2.6 kernels. We're now up to four plus uh, Linux kernels. Um, so there's obviously years, you know, uh, every year there's huge, you know, you have Dirty Cow, a bunch of other, you know, glibc um, vulnerabilities that get published, and these are all affected. You also have real-time operating systems, RTOS, and most of these, except free RTOS, are, are commercial. So except free RTOS, but you have VxWorks, you have to have licenses, QNX, which is uh, Blackberry, MQX is another flavor, uh, and Green Hills is just another, another uh, vendor as well. Then you have the Windows Embedded Land. Um, thumbs down, that's just me. But it's not that not as common. You'll see them more, uh, let's say, in uh, point of sale devices I've seen, uh, kiosks for the most part. Uh, and then Windows IoT Core, getting more common, but again, it's not as widely deployed as uh, embedded Linux. So the, bi the basics of an, of an embedded device or firmware, for example, in embedded Linux would have the flash contents, um, you have the kernel and the, and the uh, I'm sorry, flash contents, the bootloader, the kernel, and the root file system. And there's, var there's variants of, 
of different bootloaders, uh, obviously kernel versions, and then file systems, different file systems as well. Uh, there's also compression, but that's compressing the kernel. So some best practices to secure uh, embedded software. Uh, and this is mainly uh, from a defensive point of view, from a developer point of view, uh, and how these bugs get fixed. And we have you know, compliant examples and not compliant examples, but you have uh, buffer and stack overflow protection. Very huge. Uh, you have a lot of heap overflows as well, which is also in the same bucket. Injection protections, like command injections, uh, cross-site scripting, super common. You don't have uh, like SQL injections in, in embedded devices, but if it's a, a SaaS um, or provider type of web application, it, you probably, you know, it's possible. Uh, firmware updates and cryptographic signatures to secure uh, your firmware through an update process. Uh, securing sensitive information, uh, identity management, uh, embedded framework and, and uh, C-based tool chain hardening, so your libraries uh, and how you build, like your bootloader uh, for your firmware device, or your embedded device, I'm sorry. Uh, usage of debugging code and interfaces, so this would be dead code. Um, you know, we'll get into it in a second, but this will be dead code and possible uh, backdoors. Uh, transport layer security, TLS. I'm not saying SSL, I'm saying TLS. Uh, usage of data collection and storage. Privacy, how that data is being stored. Uh, Third-party coding components. Uh, that'll be keeping up to date your libraries and your, and your frameworks that are being used. Uh, but kind of most importantly that we're gonna add uh, today is threat modeling. Uh, I think threat modeling is crucial uh, in even, you know, any, well obviously any software, but any device, any type of architecture. And if they would even do basic uh, threat modeling exercises, a lot of these vulnerabilities, you know, wouldn't even come about or wouldn't even come to, to production and deployment. You know, said by Charlie Miller as well just a couple, couple days ago or last week, uh, let's threat model before designing security systems, people. Especially, you know, DVRs and uh, door locks, uh, same thing. They're basics, you know, you, if you, if you, if you were to ever to research uh, a door lock or uh, some sort of DVR or something like that that's that, uh, supposed to keep you secure from privacy or open doors, uh, safety-wise, you'll find that the most, uh, the highest vulnerabilities or critical vulnerabilities are opening doors and it's possible. Uh, I found plenty of them and there's plenty of them out there that, that don't properly, uh, you know, you can tell they don't put the, their own due diligence to secure uh, their devices uh, in multiple ways. But threat modeling will help solve that. And so this is primarily based upon a project that I'm running here at OWASP called the Embedded Application Security Project. Uh, we have it here on Gitbook, so we want to keep it as updated as possible. Uh, so if those who rose their hand and, and they're familiar with embedded devices and soft and firmware, we definitely would like feedback. And um, you know, here, here's just based on, you know, our project page here. We, have, uh, we just released our first version in March. And uh, right now we targeted uh, embedded Linux to start with. But we're gonna get we're gonna get on to uh, to RTOS and and other Windows platforms as well. So keep an eye on that. Uh, by the end, by by fall sometime, uh, we'll have another version and even go in more depth and detail uh, as far as the examples. And I would show you how it looked. Um, I have my computer up here, but basically we do have let's say command injection non-compliant example. So why is vulnerable? And then we have literally in C. Then we have a compliant example how to how to sanitize and and val validate input and how it could be compliant, you know, to put it in, um, uh, in inside your firmware, or how to even avoid using system altogether, or using different uh, patterns like number to strings. You know, if there's a command being run, refer to a, a, a static file that has the command, almost like an ORM. If you guys are familiar with ORMs, similar to that. So buffer and stack overflow, uh, same vulnerable C functions that we've known for years. Uh, here's an example, just a find command if you have uh, the static code, uh, I mean the code uh, in-house. Or use safe equivalent functions, gets, f gets. Uh, they're not a catch-all, they're not gonna, uh, you know, keep you safe from everything. You still have to do your due diligence and, and verify the bounds and, and validate uh, what's being run as far as buffer is concerned. Uh, you have to enable se uh, secure flags, uh, and that'll be for whatever build system you're using, whether it be build root uh, or Yocto, those are the most common. Uh, and they're literally just menus uh, to build your firmware automatically for you. And we'll go through an example. Oh, it's right here. So this is build root, and this is enabling uh, stack protection here. 
Simple. I mean, just a checkbox. Uh, but it's just a matter of the developers and the project managers and program managers being aware uh, how simple this could be to be enabled on their, on their builds for firmware. And here's some examples of what not to use. Uh, STRL copy. We'll go through them in detail, but if you read through them, they're pretty funny. Uh, injection prevention. Again, whitelist accepted commands. Avoid utilizing user data uh, and operating system commands. Again, validate input, output in code as well. And you could use something like comics uh, to find these command injections. It's almost like a SQL map, uh, but for command injection. Works pretty well. It also uses blind. Uh, you can find blind uh, command injections. So this would be good um, if you want to sideload your own firmware through via command injection or, or get a shell on a device. And these, again, these are very, very common uh, as far as command injections are concerned. Uh, last year at DEF CON uh, for IoT Village, it was uh, based on uh, command injection. Uh, someone was able to upload their own firmware and sideload their firmware to uh, a ransomware piece of firmware on a thermometer and spike up the, uh, <laughs> the temperature, you know, 20, 20, 20 degrees. And, uh, you know, if you have a smart lock locking someone in the house, you know, yeah, it may sound like a joke, but, you know, it's possible, uh, especially in the smart home arena. Uh, here's an example uh, of, of uh, command injection here. And it's simple, literally just inputting shell commands. And um, this is just basic ping, but obviously you can do, uh, you can run a stager, meaning uh, have, have something uh, uploaded to uh, the embedded device to pull down your whole payload. Uh, you can run, a, um, let's say something like netcat, if you want to pull down netcat binary, and then run a command to, to call that netcat binary back to you for, for a, um, a remote shell. Very, very simple. As you can see, this is a real example, by the way, that's being exploited. Um, it's part of one of the, the big botnets I was discussing, uh, Perseride, the new one. Uh, and this is a C example of, of how um, code injection uh, is, is filtered throughout the data, data flow of, uh, of an application. It's basically just having dynamic code and not, and not um, validating the input of what's being run for uh, the, the any command here. So you can just add a user based upon the any command because percent s is usually just the input that the user's putting uh, into the parameter and it's not being sanitized at all. So I'm kind of skipping through this. We only have like 10 minutes here. Uh, so firmware updates, uh, obviously very, very huge, a, a sore topic for many. Um, you know, obviously you want to update over TLS. Uh, we want to have something like automatic or, or scheduled updates. Uh, but with the caveat, medical devices, you can't just, uh, you know, update a device uh, while it's being in use in, in someone's body. Um, but you can force updates. Uh, while the scheduled updates for medical devices, let's say, I don't know, at night or, um, I don't know, scheduled updates don't work too well for Microsoft, but it's a different topic. Uh, but force updates when you have to, when it's high criticality vulnerabilities. And I've seen this in some of the DVRs that weren't affected by Mirai which is good. Uh, they've also changed some other uh, aspects of, of DVRs, and I'll get to that in a second, probably in the next couple slides here. Uh, but anti-downgrading, uh, anti-rollback protections, so uh, not being able to uh, let uh, consumers or anybody, uh, commercial uh, vendors or, or uh, clients, whatever it may be, to, to install or, or flash firmware that is a vulnerable, vulnerable version, for example, or require something like a password to download them. Uh, I've seen that done already. Uh, let's say with people like D-Link. Uh, cryptographically sign and verify updates uh, using, you know, obviously hashes and, 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 and whatnot. But also in your change logs include security related vulnerabilities that have been fixed. Uh, this is often ignored, uh, but we're definitely trying to push for this. And if you're using Yoctu or BuildRoot, um, they include their own libraries and they update their own libraries based, you know, on their discretion. So it's important to, to uh, check out or, or, or um, query which version, let's say, of UPnP library they're using. It could be a vulnerable one. Uh, and sometimes they also input uh, any type of security related CVEs that have been fixed that you could use in, or that have been fixed that you can now implement into uh, or deploy into your firmware, uh, firmware image. And firmware versions uh, clearly displayed. I think that's a big one as well, top corner somewhere. Uh, but definitely firmware updates, like I said, is pretty important and uh, a, a hard thing to solve. Um, something with like GPG, for example, pulling down a kernel 
and verifying it. Uh, you have to have some sort of infrastructure. You have to know how to store your private key, uh, how to deploy your public key. Uh, and when those expire as well, have a rollback. Uh, but this is just an example. And plenty of these uh, examples are on our, um, the Git books uh, for um, my project, uh, for the project that I'm leading. So, um, but again, uh, sore topic right here for, for verifying packages uh, and even firmware updates. Um, and I think it's important, definitely important. Uh, so securing sensitive information, they're not hard code secrets, password, usernames, tokens, or similar variants. Uh, if you have a TPM or a secure element, uh, or even trust zone if, you, if it's an ARM architecture, uh, utilize that as well. Um, you know, you definitely don't want to open, store uh, secure uh, information or sensitive information uh, in clear text and unprotected storage as well, or flash, meaning EEPROM or other flash uh, chips on a firmware device. And there's, there's plenty out there. Even an SD card, for example, uh, will be readable and writable. And this, is, this we know with, uh, with um, Android, Android devices. So very similar. And it's kind of common sense, but again, if someone did a basic threat model uh, before um, these devices are, are being deployed or mass deployed, uh, this, wouldn't be the, this wouldn't be the problem. We wouldn't have all these vulnerable devices um, within you know, uh, our, the internet, uh, public facing especially. But you know, an example of someone storing um, you know, or hard coding, let's say a backdoor or uh, an account would be, this would be here, a D-Link uh, router that accepted this user, user agent header here uh, and it would bypass authentication uh, just by sending that, that uh, user agent header. Very, very simple, but again, they probably think they use it for, uh, for support or, uh, or debugging purposes in production. Uh, but just recently, uh, you know, some people have been getting slapped in the hand, some, some vendors uh, by FTC over in the States uh, by, by not providing uh, you know, what they promise in their marketing, easy to secure advanced network security when they're hard coding login credentials and using default, you know, guess, guess by default uh, and, and broadcasting that information. So this is definitely new in our space as far as consumer devices um, because typically you know, there isn't a, a regulation, uh, there isn't a requirement, there isn't a certification for these consumer devices to follow. Uh, but for the FTC to slap people on the hand now, vendors uh, such as D-Link and we have others like, like Asus, for example, uh, they have to you know, go through uh, security measures now for a number of years to ensure they ha they've performed their due diligence. Um, and here's another uh, backdoor account. And this one was for that, that Perseri uh, botnet that's being used. Uh, this is one of the backdoor accounts that's being, that's being exploited in the wild as of right now. Um, Again, for support purposes, I've been in these conversations. You know, why do we have to? Uh, well, I know the reason why. There isn't a reason why. <laughs> but but um, let me quickly go through some of the last slides here uh, as we're running out of time. Uh, so identity management, separation of users between internal and external, whether it's console, whether it's web. Uh, set these uh, in the URL. That's super huge and common in, in embedded devices. Uh, even tokens, I see access tokens, I see long-lived tokens um, in the URL and can be replayed and are never expired. And this can be through the firmware, implemented, implemented through the firmware, but also reflects the mobile apps and the, and the other web applications that are being used. Uh, other advisements on, on, on sessions and cookies, uh, secure attributes, things along those lines, uh, randomize and invalidate uh, these sessions as well. And Put some sort of password, a uh, complex password, 32 if possible character, on uh, UART, for example, to get access to the firmware. Um, so running through here, embedded framework hardening. Uh, you know, disable FTP, Talnet, the common ones, the, the, the ancient legacy services that are being exploited actively. There's no reason why. And again, it's just a drop down menu for these vendors to, to unclick and enable even SSH and input a password. Not hard at all. Um, you know, removing unused shell interpreters. Again, super common. I can, go into, I can go into an embedded device and see dash, ash, and bash all in one device, and obviously that expands the attack surface. And then iterative threat models. And again, I pointed out, pointed out earlier how important that is. And again, there you go, bash, dash, and ZSH. Simple checkboxes with build root. And here's, you know, not enabling uh, uh, FTP here. And then enabling like SSH, for example. Again, simple. 
not hard at all. And here we talk about uh, back doors and, and, and root privileges. And again, for debugging purposes, like I said, but there's plenty of people touching the code that will forget to you know, take off their, uh, their user that they created. No one's validating. They don't have a security team most often. Like I said, 10 people for these ODM uh, uh, software firms. And uh, not one of them is focused on software security, which you know, may or may not be a surprise. And it's so common. Like I said, what's being exploited right now is a backdoor. Uh, what I just showed earlier. And this is usually what they say, just unit tests and looks good to me. That's Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder's blind. They're not looking. Uh, TLS, I don't have to beat this one down. You guys know. TLS 1.2 or higher, uh, deprecate, you know, the uh, you know, old cipher suites uh, and protocols as well, SSL, take it off altogether. And then how, how to uh, validate TLS configurations and cipher suites. Uh, I prefer test SSL server. There's actually a new one that was uh, published a few months ago. Um, but it's, also, it's based on C Sharp. It's not a jar anymore. It has m way more features. It can also uh, export or output in JSON, so you can use it into uh, a CI environment, for example. And again, no SSL is ever safe. It's never safe. Any, any type of software anymore. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that in detail. But you know, an example, Nmap and map command to find SSL v3 running on an embedded device in my network. Simple, simple. It's going to fly by through this one right here, privacy by design. Uh, acquire only, only data that's required for the, uh, the device functioning. Um, you know, not gathering intel on all the devices that are, that are being used in the network. Again, common, unfortunately. Try man in the middle in your router, and you'll be surprised what you find. And who's doing this as well as limit ad tracking? Uh, for uh, mobile is, you know, Android and iOS. You can reset your identifier. I think we're almost done here. Uh, and this is probably the, one of the crucial parts, is third-party code and components. And having a bill of materials and, and, and um, having accountability uh, with, with vendors to have a security team on staff if this, these uh, OEMs are partnering with the o, uh, OEM. And use... You know, use tools like Zap and these free tools like LibScanner, NSP. A lot of these embedded devices are now, you know, full JavaScript on the front end to take off the computational time on, on the firmware device itself. And utilize package managers. Very common, too. Uh, OP, uh, OPKJ, IPKG, uh, RPM. If you guys use, like, a Wi-Fi pineapple, use something similar. Uh, but, I mean, it's not too difficult, obviously, to take some testing uh, to update packages. You don't have to reflash the whole firmware that people are always griping about. Um, but again, uh, you know, Zap, NSP, uh, and Linus to, to do OS hardening, find out what's, what's um, as far as configurations are concerned, what needs to be worked on. Uh, and here's to find, this is using LibScanner, um, LibScanner here, for a Yaktu build. Uh, based on your packages, it'll find CVEs, uh, published CVEs. And this is the output here, the test cases. So just wrapping up here, again, threat modeling, Super important, continuous, iterative, always update. Uh, same thing with testing. Uh, and like I said, <laughs> update, update, update. Uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, from the consumer standpoint, uh, when I was working over at Linksys, having auto updates for, uh, for uh, people who are using Linksys routers, it saved them from some sort of exploit or vulnerability. Uh, and if a vendor is listening or in here are going to watch this, uh, Look up a disclosure policy, ISO 29147, to get involved in the community and be open to, uh, to bug reporting and, and, and grow that culture. And there's some closing thoughts here. Still, it's still a zero day if they didn't update it. Let's be real. Let's keep breaking things, uh, especially with us over in the, uh, the US back in October. Uh, we got uh, exempt from D DMCA, so now we can uh, research uh, these devices as long as they're lawfully acquired uh, within a controlled environment. Um, and th there's another third one, but I mean, this is huge for us when there wasn't anything like that before. Uh, so thank you. Just finish. <laughs> thank you, guys. No time for questions. Yeah, yeah. I'll be here. So feel free if you guys have any questions. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming out.